Lesson one for everybody here, never, ever, ever agree to a presentation when you have a space launch president CEO speaking before you. Um, you know, graphics and great anecdotes and inspiration, I have none of that for you. So, uh, um, so for my speech, I, I think I kind of have a bad feeling about this now. So, um, but like many of you, I uh, wanted to be uh, a space careerist thanks to NASA. Uh, wanted to be an astronaut, wanted to be an astronomer, eventually uh, settled for being an aerospace engineer. And, uh, you know, I had dreams of what I wanted to do. I wanted to work for NASA. I wanted to dispatch thousands of remote probes throughout the uh, uh, far reaches of space. So I was, I was really geeked and excited about this. Now, the problem is, is I only knew that this one entity, NASA, existed, right? Um, and, you know, you guys have heard some incredible speeches from commercial. You've heard incredible speeches from NASA, not just this time around, but the last couple years as well. And the bottom line is um, there's civil space, there's commercial space, but is that it? You know, no, you know, there is another, and that is national security space. Um, and uh, some people call it black space, some people call it dark space. I like to call it the, the dark side of, uh, you know, the dark side of space here because uh, it's often shrouded in mystery. Um, but to clear up any uh, apprehension or anything like that, no, this is not where we have like a wretched hive of scum and villainy, you know, of all the space professionals over there. I mean, there's some really good professionals that work in, in the community, uh, engineers, scientists, political scientists, um, uh, space lawyers, uh, international relations specialists, human cyborg specialists, you know, you got all kinds of people that are sitting there. So now my goal is to try to say, hey, there's something here for you all on this side. And maybe you're saying, you know, I'll never join you, right? Uh, there's different uh, reasons why, you know, but maybe it's just you don't have enough context as to what's going on. So what I want to do today is just talk about four reasons why I think um, there's just a lot of power um, working you know, on the dark side of space and national security space. The first one is the most compelling, okay? Uh, it is, it's the mission, right? Um, you have the opportunity to work for something that is a lot bigger than yourself. You have the opportunity to really work towards national security and even world security, you know, when you start working with coalitions and allies and partners. You're working to save the lives of war fighters. You're working to help intelligence professionals be able to uncover th secrets and threats before they get to our shores. Um, and, and at the end, you're protecting those who can't protect themselves and who are less uh, capable. So when other sectors think about space, and it was actually uh, perfect as Tori's uh, discussion was there, you know, a lot of people, when they think about space, it's for what's happening in space. Almost everything national security is what's happening here on Earth. And it all has to relate back to that. In our, in our business, when you come into our business, you get a lot of responsibility. Um, you get global reach, right? And, and you get a global scale. So a question to you all is this, is basically, look, do you want a job where you literally have the opportunity to change the world? And to me, that's the first reason why I think this is just a fantastic world to be in in the dark side of space. Second is the technology. Boy. You know, we got some really, really state-of-the-art things out there. And I would show you them, but I can't. So, right? Um, but look, let's put it this way. Um, NASA's budget, about 18 or $19 billion per year. And they're doing some amazing work, right? The National Security Space Budget is more. <laughs> you thought you were going to get that out of me, didn't you? So, OK. So, but the money that we invest you know, in national security space is really, is, is really developing some incredible things. Now, I get it. There is incredible innovation that's happening in the civil space market. There's incredible innovation that, that's happening within commercial space. But hey, it's not like we've been hanging around. I could pick on all kinds of space systems. So since working at NGA, I'll pick on uh, one of our spy satellites. Do you guys know, uh, older than all of you guys, 45 years ago, almost 50 years ago, actually, um, we launched film satellites into space. And those film satellites um, cost a lot of money. We had a lot of trial and error to get them up in the first place. But 45 years ago, those satellites had 60 centimeter resolution, right? 
Commercial today has 30 meter, meter, 30 centimeter resolution. So if that's what we could do back then, and that's what commercial can do today, right? So, and then it gets only better. Think about what we're planning for the future in the next decade, right? I see some of these systems there and I'm sitting there thinking, this defies engineering and physics. Uh, you know, that's, that's not true, uh, that's impossible, right? Can't do these types of things, but the fact is, is Look, I'm asking you guys without being clear to search your feelings, right? And you know what the truth is, right? But for me, when you're on this side of the fence, you get to see it, you get to touch it, you get to witness it, you get to design it, you get to operate it, you get to be a user of this kind of capability. So and we don't just design this for the sake of technology. We don't design this for profit. There is no bottom line. You can't have a, a spreadsheet that says, here's how much national security I earned today. Right? You're doing this to be able to save lives. You're, our war fighters, our intelligence professionals, the bottom line is that um, they, we don't go to war without space. And unfortunately, our adversaries know this as well, and so they're developing disruptive and destructive capabilities to be able to deny uh, our use of space. Now there's some who will say, you know, this is madness and we're doomed and start flailing their arms around and something like that, but the fact is, is that we're not. There's a lot of work going on right now um, to be able to work this through. Think about this. Um, how long have we been fighting wars on the land? Millennia. How long have we been fighting wars in the sea? Centuries. How long have we been fighting wars in the air? About, about 100 years now, right? A war that extends into space is something that we, start, we need to start having to be prepared for. We're not gonna send our troops without space capabilities because they would be more at risk. We're not gonna be able to just take away space we need to be able to provide assurance for space, right? This means developing space resiliency measures and emerging sense because basically, you know, it's unwise to lower your defenses. So I'd say, do you wanna work on cutting edge technology? Do you wanna be able to be a pioneer in, in working on this new environment of space? Um, look, somebody has to save our skins. Why not you guys, right? So this brings me to number three is uh, you get to have a seat at the table. You have the direct ability in the national security space community to have a seat at the table to influence space policy. For six years, I got to have the seat at the table at the White House, but even if I'm not there, I'm still somewhere else now at NGA, still being able to influence national security policy, national security strategy, norms of behavior, rules of the road, space regulation. If you love space regulation, we need to hear your input and you wanna be at the table. If you don't like space regulation, you get more clout and authority to be able at the table. You have the opportunity to uh, develop what's called trans, I'm sorry, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures, right? So if we're being attacked, what do you do, right? We need somebody to tell us it's a trap, right? Right, we need somebody to tell us, you know, how can an adversary be jamming us if they don't know that we're coming? Right, there's all these different things that you can do. And so do you see yourself at the table or do you see yourself trying to influence those at the table? And the last thing I wanna talk about is everything that's been talked about th this conference and f several conferences in the past, which is the opportunity for partnerships. And this one, it's unlimited in the national security community. International partnerships, right? Well, actually, let me start with this. Do you realize that we used to go it alone in the national security space community, and basically putting a lot of faith, um, people would think putting a lot of faith in our friends was um, our greatest weakness, um, but that's not the case anymore. Um, and for those of you who don't believe that, um, I think we all know where this is going. Uh, I find your lack of faith disturbing, right? So uh, it is uh, an incredible thing that's going on right now. Uh, internationally, we do so much for global stability and global security with our international partners, why can't space be part of that? We have our diplomats, we're working with our allies and even with our adversaries um, on a diplomatic mission. We're on a diplomatic mission for space transparency and confidence building measures. And finally, with respect to our international partnerships, it allows us to develop our um, common defense, it allows us to have space resiliency, and it also allows us to maybe, maybe have some cost sharing along the way there too. Uh, a lot of people get very nervous about that. 
Same thing on the commercial side. We have our traditional partners, our launch partners, our remote sensing partners, our communication satellite partners who we really work effectively with. But we have all these other new space capabilities that are coming on board. How do we partner with them? How do we not just take you all as commercial providers, as your services, but how do we invest in you? How do we invest in startups? How do we invest in um, you know, new space capabilities? So look, emerging international and commercial capabilities are uh, impressive. Uh, they're most impressive, actually. Um, and it's really a responsibility of the national security space community, Chirac's opinion here, to enable this to happen. You might think that we're trying to prevent all these types of things, but I can tell you from the inside, we're really trying to enable these types of cap capabilities. We're really trying to do everything to, you know, well, not inhibit, really, right? Um, and so are you the person who can navigate this for us? Are you the person who can bring in commercial, international, interagency capabilities, right? Allow us to stay on target for our focus on national security space and national security missions. So now, in the end, uh, only do you understand um, and if you don't, uh, then you are truly underestimating the power of the dark side of space, right? Um, if you do understand, we would be honored um, if you would join us. And um, I have to use a, I have to use a Yoda quote here for a second, right? So, uh, and if you do join us, um, help you I can, right? So, but look, the the bottom line is is is, is we really need your guys' help, uh, we need your innovation, we need your passion, we need your entrepreneurship. Uh, to be quite honest, uh, uh, when I was growing up in the space community, we did not have these types of foot forum uh, to uh, have networks. We need your networks, right, to be able to help this type of collaboration. So uh, I will leave you with the following statement, you know, uh, help us space gen and future space leaders, um, you are our only hope. So thank you. <laughs>